that Al-Anon is for anyone who's affected by someone else's drinking. Marvellous hope and transformation by simply finding your way to a meeting. Hello and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hodgins. Today I'll be discussing the organisation Al-Anon Family Groups. We are joined by Cheryl, who is the Public Information Chairperson at Al-Anon Family Groups Australia. Al-Anon Family Groups is a fellowship of people affected by the drinking of someone else, such as mothers, children and friends of alcoholics. Like Alcoholics Anonymous, it is a 12-step program. Al-Anon meetings are held in more than 130 countries and there are meetings in every Australian state. Hello Cheryl and welcome to the program. Hello Jack, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for inviting us. What is Al-Anon? It's a funny name and how many people say to me, oh Al-Anon, oh that's AA isn't it? And it's actually not AA, it's completely separate. So it's Al-Anon Family Groups and it started as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous in the early days, the wives getting together in the when their husbands were in their meetings trying to get sober and and have the support and the wives realized that this would be beneficial for them to have a support group as well to understand what they're dealing with with alcoholism so these women uh, mostly were wives of alcoholics and that was 70 years ago Mm. so um, they formed the uh, support group initially and then it evolved into developing the 12 steps that Alcoholics Anonymous use for their program. So they started a journey of um, really understanding their part in the enmeshment and the insanity of alcoholism, Mm. the family disease, which is what happens. The whole family become affected by the alcoholics drinking and behaviour. Has it been in Australia since for that long, for, for 70 years? Yes, we actually started quite remarkably. Um, it was very quickly embraced by Glebe in New South Wales, people that were really wanted to see something happen. So it started with just one member wanting to, one wife of an alcoholic, wanting to bring it to Australia and it, it grew very quickly. What is the goal of Al-Anon? The primary purpose is to support families and friends of people who have alcoholics in their lives that they love and they want to learn how to how to live with these people, how to support them and not enable them, how to still have your boundaries and not be um, lost, your identity lost. A lot of wives and husbands lose their identity when they're trying to... Um, to understand the complexity of being in a relationship with an alcoholic. And they don't understand that it's a disease, it's a serious illness, and that they're not bad people, they're just really sick people trying to find a way out of addiction. Who can join Al-Anon? Oh, anybody can join Al-Anon. If they've been affected by someone's uh, drinking, people can come into the program really not identifying directly, but they can be grandchildren. People who come into the program have been, it's missed two generations, but the isms and the enmeshment and the confusion is transferred through the generations because of the dysfunctional behaviour that comes from the family living with alcoholism. How did you come to be involved with Aladon in, in your role as the public information chairperson? I was just so impressed with what I saw and knowing that it's a not-for-profit organisation and knowing that they are funded through their own voluntary contributions, um, incredibly, it really impressed me. The fact that they were doing so much amazing good work, they really need as much support as they can get. So um, my background is marketing and business marketing, and I'm retired now, which is rather lovely. So I have nine areas throughout Australia, and we have a public information coordinator in each area which I support, and uh, we have media releases uh, going out. We have as much social media now as we can get. But once again, we are self-funded, so we do not accept uh, contributions from outside. So, And that is part of my policies, the policies of the 12-step program. Uh, Any 12-step program would be the same. And um, so I'm very happy to donate my time to this amazing organisation. For those listeners that may be interested in kind of going to a meeting, how can they go about that? Well, now we've got the internet and so many options. You can go straight to our website. It's Alanon and it's all lowercase. It's a bit tricky because it's al-anon.org.au. Simple, but you must put the hyphen in. Or, but if you Google Alanon, it'll come up, it, you know, something will come up. And then 
behavioral website, which we're currently updating and doing some major work on. So all you'll need to do is key in the area and up come the meetings. And there's lots of information on the website. You can find who we are, how we work. We have a professional's contact there if you're a professional and want to understand more of how we can cooperate and, and support professionals, especially in the area of psychology and mental health, how we fit with them. It's all there on the website. What are the 12 steps? 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous started, um, gosh, how old is Alcoholics Anonymous? I think 1938 for memory. There you go. You've done some <laughs> research. I'm impressed, Jack. Um, so it started from the Oxford group, which was um, a very old religious group. And it was a six-step program that Bill W., the founder of AA, looked at when he was desperate after trying to get sober many, many times. And so he was able to get sober through this six-step program, but miraculously he developed it into a 12-step program through the help of himself and people, which were the founders of AA. And so we adapted the 12 steps, which is a journey through getting to know yourself, getting to understand your patterns. If you, if you enmesh with someone who's got an addiction, and they're caught up in that terrible driven behaviour of promising they won't drink, but then they pick up again. The mother, the father, the husband needs to understand how powerless they are because the person who's got the addiction is powerless. So we have to understand we're powerless to make them change. Mm. And then we go to step two and look at the insanity of what we're trying to do to stop them. Lock them in their room. They'll... Um, Get the alcohol and pour it down the sink. They'll um, they'll make excuses to their bosses about how they couldn't come to work because they're sick and they actually got a hangover. So all this stuff is very inappropriate behaviour because a the alcoholic needs to experience the consequences of their own actions. And so we we look at the insanity of trying to force solutions in step two. And step three is you know coming to coming to um, decide that you're going to hand that willfulness, that insanity over to a power greater than yourself. Now, initially, a lot of the members see that as the group because the group collectively has got a lot of knowledge and good, healthy um, suggestions on how to change your behaviours. And so that's a really, you know you've got this support network, a shared support network. It's very, very empowering for them. And then you start the working steps, which are steps four through to nine. And the fourth step is about a personal inventory, your strengths and your weaknesses. It's very empowering because you start to see your destructive behaviour, which you need to look at and find a way to change it. And that's part of the steps going forward. But the other part of it is looking at your, your strengths. And because a lot of people come into the program and they've, they've lost their confidence, they've lost, lost their identity, they believe they caused their loved one to drink. The loved one has told them many times that that's a fact, which is not true. They need to have their self-esteem reinstated. Um, and some people who have grown up in alcoholism, adult children especially, they never really developed a sense of self. They've really just been surviving mm. and they've been really doing it pretty hard. So that's why we look at step four, the positives and the negatives. And then we start to look at the change and five, six through to nine are the change steps, which is the program and it's so empowering to see people. That's what's inspired me. To see people come in, their whole body language is negative. They're either full of rage and fury or they're completely defeated with enormous despair. And to see them transform mm. into a completely different, you know, a, a person that's, thriving and in life and able to embrace life. There's a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety with people when they come into program. They're working, the ongoing working steps. So the, the 12 steps is a program for living. I mean, and I think it says in the big book somewhere, you know, and this could be helpful to all people because a lot of people are lost. So um, the step 10, 11 and 12 become the everyday everyday steps which which support you in your clarity of thought so the 10th step is a, a step which you continue to take your own personal inventory and when you're wrong probably meet it so sometimes when you become more aware of who you are and how you operate which is once you get to step 10 and of course you do this with a sponsor 
So we have a sponsorship program, which is very powerful. So these amazing people start to have a program for living, which is 10, 11, and 12. And 10 is that, you know, have I, have I harmed myself or have I harmed others? Ask yourself on a daily basis. If you have harmed yourself, then you have to make amends. You may have to go back to someone and say, look, I've overcommitted myself. I can't do all this. I need to say no or, and have the courage to do that because people pleasing is a big part of the isms. I'll do more, I'll be more, I'll have more, and then my life will be manageable. But the al program is really, really powerful for transformation and it gives you a roadmap on how to be you know, a really contented, um, happy person, regardless of whether the loved ones in their lives have changed. So mm. that's remarkable. You're listening to Wellbeing, where we're discussing the organisation al Family Groups. My guest today is Cheryl. Public Information Chairperson at Allen on Family Groups Australia. Are there any other organisations in this field that kind of help family members specifically? or There's professional organisations um, who quite often, um, when people go into rehab now, um, they have family nights and they will invite the family in to talk to them about how how the alcoholic is going to go home and what it's going to be like for them and and try and help the family understand what's going on. And there's also some rehab programs which are remarkable that they actually bring the families in for a week or so, which is what I've heard from different members that that's what's happened. And as the consequence in in that transitional period from the alcoholic coming out of rehab, in that transitional period, the families are really encouraged to go to Al-Anon or al If you're a child between the age of 12 and 20, you are really encouraged to go to al because it's exactly the same program, but it's for the children. And they, the identification is what we think is the most powerful thing. How is al It's the same program, but is it different in any way or like approach differently? Or um, It's exactly the same program. The difference is that you've got children talking about their issues from 12 to 20 who they're at school, how they feel, how isolated they feel, um, all the um, in, introverted behaviour, all the overt behaviour, children acting out. So they, they're in this group talk, and they have the 12 traditions, which is how the structure is. We have the 12 steps for recovery for the person. We have the 12 traditions for how the group is run. Watching these children run their own program, and they do have two sponsors which have to be police checked and they go through an interview process to become sponsors. So, and they have to have some criteria of recovery um, years in the program. Those two, two sponsors are there, but they're only supporting them. They don't direct, they don't run the meeting for them. The children select their own chairperson, which is rotational, and they choose a topic and it might be on resentment. And then is they have their own little readers, which is daily readers, and they can share from that. They have their own some of their own literature, but they also use the al literature. We have a lot of literature. And uh, and they also do a little bit more interactive exercises because they're, they're children and it's a different form. But pr- it's the same program. The effect that alcoholism has on the family members acknowledged enough? Absolutely not. Um, the community have no idea. It is really sad that Al-Anon family groups is not as as well known as AA. You would say, oh, I go to AA and they go, oh, yeah, they know it's Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, we say, have you heard of Al-Anon family groups? And they go, what's that? That's AA, isn't it? It is incredibly sad because statistically at least six to eight people are directly affected by an alcoholic's behaviour. And when I say directly affected, we're talking serious mental illness, serious obsessive compulsive disorders, serious anger management problems, especially in male male children, Um, very inverted um, uh, suppressed emotion. It's a really serious, serious thing Mm. that you get six people directly affected and that sense of loss those people have about which way to go in life is very powerful. That's what I'm all about. I just want to get it out there that this is an amazing resource, free. We have Zoom meetings now so people can come from anywhere anywhere in the 
world. We've got Zoom meetings where people are coming in from all over the world now, plus Australia. So, and um, because Australia is such a large country, we, we struggle. We're having lots of face-to-face -face meetings absolutely everywhere. But now we've got Zoom. It's very exciting. How many establishments does Al-Anon have across Australia? Well, we have the nine areas, um, nine offices, like supporting those areas. And Australia-wide, each area comes together in a conference. So the delegate of each area comes together and we have a conference once a year. So we share, we have very powerful link, links of service. So at the general service office where I am, we're at the national office and we just, we are, we support all of them and support them in the website and literature and these sorts of things. And we also link to World Service Office in America. So that brings the links of service together. But the nine areas are autonomous in that they develop their needs for the specific needs of the area because they're all quite unique. So we are, all of Australia is well covered. And then from there we have districts, each area manages districts, and then we have groups within those districts. So it's a lovely way of linking the service structure. Is it hard for a family member or friend that's affected by someone who has alcoholism to kind of ask for help or to go to Al-Anon for that first meeting? Is it hard for them? I think it's really hard because sometimes there's shame because they think they caused it, especially when it comes to parents. They really believe they made their child an alcoholic. Well, that's absolutely not true. It doesn't mean the behaviour and your reactive behaviour doesn't need to be looked at, but you did not. No one causes anyone to be an addict. No one. So, um, so that stops them, and sometimes it stops them from staying because they don't stay long enough to get that understanding. So I think it's a courageous thing. Anybody that walks into a room, for some reason there seems to be a prerequisite you have to be absolutely shattered. And then sometimes your will and your determination, your intellect says, no, no. Or they hear um, the spiritual side of the, the meeting and they get scared and they go, oh, it's all this God stuff, I'm out of here. Which is, um, we're a spiritual program, we're not a religious program and we don't affiliate with anyone. So it's it's your choice how you develop your higher, higher self. Initially, I think most people say their higher self is the group. So... Um, but they do a runner on that because they have issues, you know, they come in with all these preconceived issues. So it's very hard to have the courage to come into a room and sit there. But what happens when a new member comes in? We suggest they try six meetings before they decide whether Al-Anon is for them or not. And we say, take what you like and leave the rest. There are no musts. So we really try and make them feel safe. They don't need to share. As the meeting goes, the chairperson, would you like to say something? But mostly people don't. But we, we really try and encourage them to try those six meetings before they decide one way or the other. Very, very hard thing for people to, I think they should be able to fix it themselves. And there's also the secrecy and the shame. Oh, my God, I can't let anybody know what's going on in my house. Everybody knows because the noise is incredibly loud. But... Uh, um, but they think no one knows. Are they weekly meetings or like how often do you have them? Oh, there's a meeting every morning, every afternoon, every evening somewhere in Australia. So uh, people can go to a meeting every night or they can go to one a week. Um, I think people who have been really traumatised find that they pretty much go to a meeting every night until they start to get their head clear because they're in such a mess. And it's the only place where they get a bit of mental respite. Until they settle, you know, and then, mm -hmm. it, and then you, you find a group that you're really comfortable with and then they, they, it becomes their home group and it becomes their intimate circle of support. It's a very powerful thing. You're listening to Wellbeing, where we're discussing the organisation Al-Anon Family Groups. My guest today is Cheryl, Public Information Chairperson at Al-Anon Family Groups Australia. What is the importance of the uh, spiritual aspect of the program? Well, I think it's a very important aspect, but you take it on as you want it to be because spirituality has, I think what happens with this alcoholism and the way people are, they, they've they lost their sense of instinct. They've lost their sense of intuition. They are confused. They doubt themselves. And so the first exercise in concept of, 
hearing yourself, listening to yourself, learning to pause, learning to think, hang on, what is going on here? That's going within and asking yourself and, and sitting with yourself and breathing through something that's really triggering you perhaps quite badly and not reacting, zipping your lip, just minding your own business, which is really hard work when you're used to getting in there and fighting. Um, it starts to give you a sense of inner confidence and the inner confidence grows to an inner knowing and then with the practices we have we we say encourage that encourage that you actually do know truth you do know what's true and what is real especially once you've learned about alcoholism and the addiction and that's what you really do need to understand it um, and then slowly you build up your own sense of spiritual self and the practices become rather beautiful really um mm. i really like to i like to meditate myself now and um i find it incredibly empowering to start my day with meditation what kind of environment are the meetings environment they're usually church halls they're cheap because <laughs> there's very little money so um but so they're usually community centers that will rent a room or a church hall that will rent a room um, we're self-supporting, so we make sure we either pay rent or we pay a donation of a book or something. Um, it's but it's usually very cheap rent, like twenty dollars for the night for the venue, and and it's really hard when you've got a group that's only got say six or eight people in the outer blocks of Australia, um, and they're very limited with funds because financial um, poverty is a big part of family disease. You know, the money's all going on alcohol or whatever else they're spending it on. So there's very little money and um, so we are always in very obscure <laughs> venues but um, the details are there and there's a contact number in the in the meeting list so you can ring someone say, look, I, I'm coming to this meeting, can someone meet me at the front or something? Is it possible for a family member to thrive even though there's someone that's suffering from alcoholism? Oh, yes, I see it with the Alateen children. It's a miracle. The Alateen children, because they're younger, they get it early and they they get that they didn't cause, the, cause it and they then they very quickly get the idea that the, their loved one, their parent, is a really sick person, not a bad person. And watching those children turn around, their attention at school improves. They are able to absorb knowledge. You know, it's, just, it's a fact that children who are coming out of trauma at home lose the ability to absorb knowledge in, in the classroom. They just, the confusion's too great for them. Watching that turn around, and I've seen people come into program in their 30s and 40s, and then they go back to study, they finish degrees, they have a complete career path change, They and they're still living in that environment. It's just remarkable because they love these people. And alcoholics are incredibly charming, gorgeous human beings. It's just got a terrible sickness. And it's like Jekyll and Hyde, you know, the, you see this horrible, revolting person come out when they've been drinking. And then when they're not drinking, they're just charming. <laughs> I find it fascinating myself. Yeah. I think that's a good point too, because I think society overall, I think when they kind of say the term alcoholic, they kind of only view the people as an alcoholic, like that's all that there is, where in fact it's like there's so much that makes up that person. Ah, oh, gosh, yes. Gosh, yes. Yes, I think that, and, and if you go to conventions, and I've been lucky to go to a few conventions where it's an AA, Alcoholics Anonymous convention with al -Anon participation. So they invite us to, have to, to come and participate because they realise we are such an integral part of the whole family dynamic and they want us there. So we do our own program alongside AA, but when I get the privilege of going in and listening to the AA members talk, oh my goodness, you know, in recovery, they are just the most amazing people and the knowledge and intention of goodness is, oozes out of them. So um, they become valuable members of society and they quietly carry their message anonymously, but amazingly um, in their own special way.
Where would you like to see Al-Anon going in the future? Well, I would like the concept of Al-Anon to be in schools. I would like uh, it to be part of a curriculum. <laughs> I would love um, it to be part of all the education um, uh, curriculums in all the mental health faculties. It would be fantastic. I would like to see um, more of the al system or the structure um, encouraged through the government, um, through some of the health programs they have, and of course through all the hospital systems. Um, more and more nurses understanding when they've got an alcoholic in the room what's going on and and then to be able to see the families out there waiting desperately to see what's going on. If a nurse could go and speak to the family and say, Look, perhaps you could try Alan on. So that's where I would love Alan on to go. And this is my this is me really working towards that. And I just think it's a powerful tool for good in our community. And we just can't afford to ignore it anymore. Um, addiction and alcoholism is not going to go away. Um, the despair it creates in our society is shocking. And the financial cost on our society is huge. So, mm. um, yeah, it's got to come right out into the open and be right out there in the education. We've got to educate. What would be the take-home from this interview you'd want people to remember the most? That al is for anyone who's affected by someone else's drinking and that there is hope, marvellous hope and transformation by simply finding your way to a meeting and sitting down and just being in a meeting for six meetings before you decide. But al is hope. It really is. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you today, Cheryl. Lovely to talk to you, Jack. My guest today was Cheryl. Public Information Chairperson at al Family Groups Australia. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins, and all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.